Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiser here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. Uh, this is quite a lengthy procedure. It's a really complicated and challenging case. It's of a patient who attended with bilateral, fully occluding, wet, sticky, matted earwax, and their entire ear canal was blocked right from the entrance all the way to the eardrum. When you've got wet, sticky wax like this, it's very difficult to suction, and you can just see why there. The, the wax, as it was traveling up the suction tube, got blocked. So I had to come out of the ear and uh, use a cleaning rod to push through the suction probe to clear any blockages. And that will happen continuously, even when I use some medical-grade olive oil spray to change the consistency. And as the procedure comes along, you will see that this patient had... Um, a lot of matted wax right on the eardrum as well. And the eardrum itself has got um, almost like an adhesive property, So, um, as does the wax. So the two were stuck together, and there were many, many loose hairs on the eardrum, which were very difficult to remove. I eventually, if you stay tuned, you'll see it. I had to use forceps to remove the, the hair strands from the eardrum. But that's a very delicate procedure because um, if I apply too much pressure with the forceps up against the eardrum, uh, there's there's a slight chance um, that I could perforate the eardrum and make matters a whole lot worse, which we, we certainly don't want to do. So we're probably about a centimetre into the ear canal now. The entrance has been cleared. You can see just how many hairs this patient has at the entrance of the ears. And whenever you've got hairs deep like this and matted against the, um, the eardrum, we have to ask ourselves, why is this? So the outer third of the ear canal is made up of cartilage and the skin lining the cartilage has three layers. You've got the outermost layer um, called the uh, epidermis layer. Then you have the dermis layer, and then finally you've got a subcutaneous layer, which is a, a layer of insulating fat and connective tissue. And that rests on uh, perichondrium um, tissue, which then sits onto the cartilage. So the skin that lands the ear canal is, is a lot thicker. Uh, it's about a millimeter in thickness uh, when compared to the skin that lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal. The inner two thirds of the ear canal is what we call the osseous portion of the ear canal, it's the bony part. And unlike the cartilage portion of the ear canal, the bony part of the ear canal only has the outermost layer of um, skin, the epidermis layer. Why is that important when it comes to um, discussing the hairs in the ear? Now, the hair follicles are uh, found. Um, within the dermis layer, the middle layer, and sometimes also the subcutaneous layer. So based on that rationale, um, we shouldn't have any hairs growing on the bony part of the ear canal because there is no dermis and there is no subcutaneous layer. So whenever you see hairs this deep, um, there's several possible plausible reasons. Um, a lot of people trim the hairs on the outside part of their ears and they can do that using clippers or um, scissors. And these hairs have got the uh, potential of flying into the ear. And when they fly into the ear, they can mat against the wax, form almost like a, a, a matrix, uh, um, some, like a scaffolding effect almost, like a spider's web, these hairs. And then the wax can form in between the, the individual hair strands. Um, the other potential reason is that if you're using cotton buds, for example, um, you're scraping in the ear and these hairs are getting pulled out uh, from the follicles and you're just then further pushing them through. Of course, um, like with our scalp or any other part of the body, these, the hair cycle, the hair growth cycle, I think it's around three months if I'm, if I'm correct. So these hair, hairs do have the potential of falling out naturally, but because they are near the entrance of the ear canal, when you see this amount of wax, it can't just be that these hairs have simply fallen out of the ear and they've made their way 
to the eardrum. This has most certainly been uh, pushed in or uh, sometimes propelled in with water. A lot of um, people now, especially in the UK, because it's extremely difficult to uh, visit the GP and um, even if you are able to, um, through no fault of their own, um, GPs no longer offer, um, most GPs should I say, no longer offer earwax removal services. And that's for several reasons, but in part because they don't actually receive the funding. And so it's a very complicated system. Um, so for that reason, a lot of patients are now, uh, the first port of call is to go to the pharmacy, get some earwax drops to soften the wax, and then they can buy over-the-counter bulb or flared syringes to try to flush the wax out. Um, do I recommend that? Um, no, but do I understand why people do it? Of course, because if you've got a blocked ear and you want to clean your ear and you've got these um, DIY kits on the, on the shelf, you, one would assume that they're safe and um, effective. But And for some people it can be effective, but there is many, many potential risks when you use over-the-counter products like that. Uh, which we'll come on to in the moment. Now you can see I just introduced the forceps for the first time. It's still difficult for me to judge exactly where the eardrum is because we've still got this layer of wax and um, hairs. So I took a few hairs out. I'm going back in with the sucker just to reveal the eardrum. And once the eardrum's revealed, I'll be more comfortable using the forceps to try and remove the remainder of the hairs. So it's almost like a nest, a haystack almost, these hairs together. I can feel it wanting to come away in a, in a, in a, um, in a large plaque almost. When I was moving that sucker, I could feel, um, physically feel these hair fibres, hair loose hair strands moving together. Because they're all coagulated now, they're all more or less stuck together because of the wax. Um, filling up the gaps in between the individual hair strands. Again, here I can feel that these hairs want to come out as a whole, as a, uh, a flock of hair. Um, that's the word I was looking for. So just going back to um, self-remedies of earwax removal, um, whenever you flush water in the ear, you're always running the risk of developing an ear infection. And that's because when you have water in the ear, um, it provides a perfect breeding ground for bacteria and fungus to um, colonize and multiply and so it's almost like an incubator the ears dark warm and then moist also uh, water in the ear can lead to um, uh, the a layer of protective oils that are sitting on the surface of the skin to be washed away and by doing that the ear is no longer able to retain internal moisture. Um, so the, the moisture within the skin cells are no longer um, protected and when that oily layer is washed away, it's leached away. So the moisture within the skin cells uh, reach the surface and they evaporate. So ironically, if you've got dry ears, you may think by using water you're actually going to moisturise your, your ear, but in fact, it's the opposite. The water washes away this um, the, the different oils and fats that are, uh, are located on the surface of the, um, the ear canal. And the, the, these oils are secreted by the glands in the ear, the sebaceous glands and the ceremonious glands, which eventually form earwax, ironically. They amalgamate with dead skin cells, exfoliated uh, dead skin cells to form earwax. Um, also, if you... On the... On the contrary to that, though, if you're um, exposing your ear to a lot of water over a prolonged period of time, what can happen then is that the skin cells, so the layer of skin coating the ear canal, it's hydrophilic, so it, it's attracted to water, so it absorbs the water, and the skin cells then overhydrate. And when they overhydrate, this, the skin cells um, then rupture and burst from the membranes. And it can cause maceration of the skin where the skin becomes very soggy and moist and damp. So it depends on how much water and how prolonged the exposure is. So um, if you do have very dry, itchy ears and you think water is going to be helpful, it can 
can be counterproductive. So just just be careful with that. So I'm still trying to visualize some of the eardrum. So I've just gone to the front part of the account. You can just see how difficult this is, the consistency. It's sticky. You've got all these hairs. They're matted. Um, they are just compressed and impacted. So I'm just going to the roof. I think I'm going to be using the forceps again. You may have noticed I've allowed um, the comments. Um, I've had so many email requests um, from a lot of um, subscribers and followers across all platforms. And uh, the reason why I disabled the comments, it was just too much um, abusive uh, comments for whatever reason. Um, so I just decided, to, I, I forgot when I disabled it now, it must be quite a few few months. Um, but we've had a lot of emails coming in and the the emails that I've received are from subscribers and followers that almost find um, relief and um, they explained it like it's like a community for them when they can leave comments and um, have conversations with other subscribers and followers. So I have disabled it, which I shall monitor it. No doubt there will be, of course, um, there's always one <laughs> who's going to uh, just be continue to be abusive and leave horrible comments. But because of the, the, the volume of emails I've received from a lot of fans, I just thought, let's just reactivate it in the short term and um, gorge and take it from there and play it by ear, <laughs> as the saying goes. So you can see now, I can see the posterior aspect of the eardrum. You can see there's a bit of a blue tinge. So at this stage, the patient could hear significantly better. But of course, I want to try and remove as many of these hairs as possible. Now, I'm not going to remove all of them. It's just not possible. Uh, without uh, potentially causing trauma to the ear. So I'm just going to be sensible and remove as much as I can. And with these forceps, with, with most forceps, they, they can be quite deceptive. The tip, although it may not appear, it, it's got a, almost a pointed edge to it. And that's what gives the, the forceps that, uh, almost like a, a, obviously they're called crocodile forceps for a reason. So they, they kind of narrow inwards for, and that, that provides maximum grip. So to the, to the distal end, the, the, the furthest part away from us of the forceps has got a slightly pointed uh, geometry. And so when you're going right up against the eardrum, you've got to be careful you don't apply too much pressure because there's always a chance, um, if not perforating the eardrum, but bruising it and causing some form of trauma, which can then lead to an infection. So I got quite a lot of hairs out there and they're coming out in flocks. But I just want to, because the hairs are quite wet and sticky, I just want to suction some of the wet wax off the hairs to make them slightly dry. So, and that will allow the forceps to achieve a better grip. And just go into the back part of the ear canal just to suction some of this dead skin and wax away. Um, whilst you're watching that, just I've had a, quite a busy weekend um, visiting some family uh, um, over the last week or so. And um, when I did, I, I took my equipment with me. Um, one of my nieces to suffer from earwax impaction, and we just wanted to make sure. Uh, I removed it a couple of years ago, so whilst I was visiting, I just wanted to make sure it hasn't. Uh, um, Reblocked because uh, she was slightly complaining that she is not hearing as well. So uh, whilst I was there, um, it transpired that a lot of the family members had ear problems of various um, types and conditions, different symptoms. So it was quite an interesting afternoon. So I ended up doing a clinic um, at, at my relatives and, uh, and had some really, really interesting cases. Um, one that I'm going to follow up and the other was um, 
removal from my one of my younger nieces and it had really really impacted wax and keratin so um, it was a challenge to say the least but we managed uh, I'm glad to to say so I'm just going a bit deeper now this is um, or should I say lower it's in the inferior recess you can see I'm just getting the ends get closer to get better visuals I'm just trying to lift away some of these hairs but more so to just dry them up a bit, just vacuum away any oils and wax, dampness that's coating these hairs just to dry it up and it will then allow me to pinch them away a bit better with the forceps. When the hairs are quite oily, they're more difficult to grasp and grip. But again, we're seeing a lot more of the eardrum. You can just see the umbo in the middle of the eardrum you can see a, kind of a red a red circle if you like um it's like the bullseye so that's called the umbo the umbo is the part of the hammer bone also known as the malleus that connects to the eardrum in, in its central uh, position and that previously wasn't visible so that's now in sight And to be told, I'm happy at this stage. The patient could, felt as though they can hear uh, back to normal again, but they were really still. As I just decided to see if I can get a few more out. You can see the majority of the eardrum. This wet wax, matted wax, is more in the anterior recess. So in most of our ears, we've got two recesses. The first is at the base of the eardrum, and it's almost like a trench or a base, and we call that the inferior recess. So inferior means towards um, the floor. Superior means towards the sky. Anterior, where we are now, means to the front, posterior, to the back. And then, So the first uh, recess we typically have is an inferior recess, but it's a little trench at the floor, of the ear canal adjacent to the eardrum and then we can also get one anteriorly so to the front part of the eardrum and that's because as the ear canal travels towards the eardrum itself it narrows around about half a centimeter away and then it widens again so it protrudes back out and that's what creates these recesses these alcoves um, Everyone's different though. I have seen some patients who don't have an anterior recess, but they've got a posterior uh, recess. But typically, it's to the front of the ear canal and to the base of the ear canal where we get these little dips and alcoves. So just going back in, I'm just using the fine end now just for a bit more precision. It's less noisy, it's, it's less traumatic. So if we do penetrate accidentally a bit deeper than we should up against the eardrum is less likely to cause any trauma or discomfort so that's the eardrum um, hiding away behind these these strands of hairs so i'm just using the fine end almost to try to glide these hairs off because uh, they are stuck at the moment because they're quite sticky as i mentioned right at the beginning of the, vid the video not only is the earwax sticky, but the eardrum itself, the outer layer, um, it's made up of the same skin that lines the inner two thirds of the ear canal, the epidermis layer. That in itself is also a bit sticky. So we're just trying to pull them apart. Going back to the home DIY methods of removing earwax, um, also, another problem with water is you can sometimes accidentally and inadvertently flush the wax further into the ear. So the concept, when, you, when you're using water to flush out earwax, the concept is, is that you pump the water into the ear, it travels along the ear canal to the eardrum, and then the ear canal slowly fills up, and then the water makes its way back out. And as it's coming back out, it's flushing out any, any wax that you may have. So it can be an effective procedure. It's not to say that it's not, but there are more risks attached to um, 
is, we don't call it syringing in the UK. Syringing is when you use a metal syringe to a high pressure to flush it out. That's actually banned in the UK. The only place you'll see a metal syringe in the UK is in a museum. Um, instead, in the UK, we call it ir irrigation. So it's a, a similar device. In fact, it was a modified, the first, very first ear irrigator was a modified dental um, hygiene water pump where when you visit the dentist and they, they flush out um, any debris that you may have using um, a, a controllable flow of water. So you have a little tank of water, a little nozzle that goes into your ear and um, the dental, uh, the dentist or the dental hygienist would originally flush the water in using um, a foot pump. So they, if you want a higher flow of water being pumped into the mouth, the, they can just simply, almost like a, when you're revving your car, you just put your foot down and to reduce the flow of water being pumped into your ear, you then uh, take your foot off the, the pedal, so to speak. So those ear irrigation machines um, do exist, but it all originally stemmed um, from the device that is used to uh, used by dentists and dental hygienists to flush out, um, to pump water and clean out um, your oral cavity. There are variations now, so you can get uh, ear irrigation pumps where you can control the, the flow um, on the by pressing a, a digitally a setting, or by um, almost with a, a almost like a trigger. So you put your finger on a trigger, and the more you you pull your finger towards you, you increase the flow, and the more you let go of your finger, it reduces the flow. So there's many different ways of controlling the flow of water. So ear irrigation is regarded as being a lot, lot safer than ear syringing because you, you, there is some control of the flow of water. You're not always having to um, pump water at extremely high pressure, which can then possibly perforate the eardrum. Um, and that's one of the reasons why ear syringe, uh, metal ear syringe in the UK uh, are no longer uh, allowed to be used. So ear irrigation, some of the risks, the same risks as the procedure I'm performing that right now with microsuction and ear hooks and scoops and forceps. Um, but with ear irrigation, you're more likely to develop these potential uh, risks and side effects. So they include temporary or, in the worst case scenario, permanent hearing loss, um, tinnitus, which is a typically described as a ring of buzzing noise in your ears, but it can actually be any type of sound that originates from either within inside your ears or your head. Uh, vertigo, especially if you have the temperature wrong. If you have the temperature of the water too hot, it can excite the balance organ in the ear that you're performing the procedure in. So that ear sends um, incorrectly more messages to the brain than it should do. And it tricks your brain into thinking that you're moving, but you're not. So then you experience vertigo, nausea, even sickness. And conversely, if the water's too cold, so when you've got cold water in the ear, it inhibits the organ of balance. So the organ of balance is sending less signals to the brain than it should. And it has a similar effect. Your brain, it tricks your brain to thinking you're moving in the opposite direction. And you can experience vertigo. So vertigo is not a condition, it's a symptom. It's a sensation of the room spinning around you or you spinning around the room. And sometimes it can be accompanied by sickness or nausea. So you're more likely to develop, uh, we call it the caloric effect, you're more likely to experience vertigo with ear syringing or irrigation than you are with suction. Now, you still can experience it with suction. Uh, when you perform suction, it's, it's when it's sucking air out of your ear, it does cool the temperature somewhat. And so... Sometimes we do experience the caloric effect when you perform microsuction. Uh, sometimes you can get dizzy for other reasons as well. You can stimulate uh, particular nerves or um, within the ear. But also, if you've got a, a big plug of wax and you're sucking it out, it can create a, a suction effect, a, a cupping action. So the organ of balance in the ear is affected by uh, temperature, and also pressure, so you can still, I'm not, it's not to say you still can't experience vertigo when you perform microsuction because you can. Um, so they're the main risks, but 
I think these risks are a lot more mitigated when you perform microsuction. I think with the microsuction, the, the biggest thing is that it is quite noisy and you're using a vacuum and it, it can be, whenever I perform the procedure, I do emphasize that it's going to be noisy and it's going to be noisier than the patient expects. To begin with, the patient may not really experience the noise because obviously the areas are full of wax, but you, 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 prepare, you prepare them. And of course, if it's noisy, too noisy, you ask them to let us know. Most people tolerate it really, really well, though. Um, so it's not an issue, but for some people it can be, especially if they suffer from hyperacusis. Hyperacusis is when some patients are, have a, a sensitivity to sound. So sounds that we may perceive as being quiet or moderately loud, some of the hyperacusis um, may experience that as being much louder and to the point where it's uncomfortable. Um, so if, if at all possible, I always try and remove wax in those cases um, using dry instrumentation, so hooks and scoops, mechanical removal I call it. So we're not performing microsuction, but we're mechanically removing it using a St. Bart's ear hook, for example, or an ear crate, a Jobson horn, or forceps. Um, sometimes people can suffer from uh, tinnitus already, and tinnitus can be exacerbated by uh, loud sounds. Of course, their tinnitus could just improve by the removal of the wax, so it can work both ways. As you can see, it's a similar issue to their right ear. This wax is really wet, sticky, it's matted. I'm just trying to leverage it off the floor of the ear canal. You can see there's a layer of skin there, some keratin. Now, when you've got patients with this amount of hair, it's probably not, it's probably a bit stereotypical, but um, mainly it's um, as we get older um, and, and it's, it occurs in men. So um, I'm at that age now where I'm starting to, uh, my hair's beginning to thin slightly and I'm, I'm not growing hair in certain parts of the body as well as I used to, but they then start to grow. Uh, especially in men, um, up your nostril and in your ears. So it's probably more gender and age specific when you've got this much hair in your ear. Occasionally it can obstruct the view. In this case it's not, although it may, it may obscure the view slightly, so it may not provide always the best optics and visuals when you're watching it. But from a clinician's point of view, when we're performing the procedure, it's not really affecting me. But sometimes it can. And in those cases, I generally use the forceps and pluck the hairs out um, so I can get a, obtain a better view. I've just had to use some olive oil medical grade spray here to change the consistency because it was becoming a bit difficult to remove any more wax. The oils just, it's helped to lubricate the inside of the suction probe. So it, reduces the likelihood of wax getting trapped as it's traveling up. In addition, it's lubricated the walls of the ear canal, so it's reduced friction, which can then facilitate the extraction of the wax plug. And it also helps to bind this wet wax together. When you've got wet wax like this, when you suction it, it just comes away in little chunks. So the oil helps to um, almost combine and um, bond and all the wax together so when you do suction it comes out in larger uh, larger chunks i always compare it to uh, an egg in a uh, when you in a recipe where you're binding ingredients together like a potato cake or fish cake and you see it's really helped fortunately on this there right ear there wasn't any hairs that are matted up against the eardrum which is good it was good in the sense where because it, it was quite a challenge in there in their left ear and um so it was, i was fortunate we didn't have to to, to, to um, use the forceps up against the eardrum on this there right here. Just a bit of dead skin here, I'm just going to peel that away. Got to be careful, it, it doesn't clarinet sometimes when we suction dead skin. The skin violently flaps at the tip of the sucker. That can emit a very loud squeal, high frequency squeal. It's not only loud for the patient, but it's also loud for myself. So it's just going to be a bit careful. We're just back near the entrance again, it's just mopping away all this wet wax. So in total, um, this procedure, the patient was in the room for about 45 minutes. The, me physically being in the ear, it was 
uh, as you can see on the screen, it's about 31 minutes, but quite often it's having to come out of the ear, clean the suction tube, clean the, wipe the lens of the endoscope. So we did run over um, the clinic. So uh, at the clinic, we arranged half an hour appointments. And the half an hour appointments are for the worst case scenarios in, 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 in typically. Um, a normal average earwax removal can take literally minutes to do per ear. But I always allocate half an hour because you just don't know which patient's going to come in where it's a bit more complex. So in this case, it's, it, you, can see, you can see it's we're way over the allotted time. So it's a very, very complicated case um, for that reason. But um, I went outside just to explain to the patient who was, who was, who was waiting that we won't be too much longer. And they're, they're very appreciative that we come out and advise. And, and of course, they... They understand that not every procedure is going to be straightforward. So um, I've never had a patient not being who's been a bit disgruntled that they're having to wait because they know when they're in the room, they're going to get the exact same treatment from myself and we're going to do everything properly without shortcuts. So I'm just trying to go through the hair without making direct contact because it can blur the lens slightly blurred it there well i hope you enjoyed that video guys it was a long one do take care keep well speak soon bye